A'udhu Billah Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim In the name of God, most merciful, ever merciful, and may God's peace and blessings be upon His Holy Prophet Muhammad and the purified members of His household and progeny. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum. Brothers, sisters, respected viewers, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaykum as We were discussing the teacher in Islam. We began with a quick discussion on or about who is the teacher in the absolute sense. In other words, when you hear scholar or teacher in Islam, where should your mind go first? And we said that the real answer to this question is that it should go to the infallible. It should go to the ma'soom. It should go to the person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed as a teacher for you. Because that person has a guaranteed knowledge. We are 100% sure that the knowledge that this person is going to convey, to give us, is going to be correct knowledge. It's going to be the truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to, to know and to achieve. As for everyone else, yes, they are scholars, Yes, they are knowledgeable people, but we are interested in the part that they have to share that matches what the infallible has to teach, what the infallible has taught and has said. To the extent that what they say matches the Holy Quran, to the extent that what they say matches the sayings of someone who is infallible, then we consider that person to be also a scholar and a knowledgeable person, and that's the knowledge that we want from them. That was the first discussion that we had. The second discussion that we had had to do with the importance of choosing the right scholar and the right teacher. And in order to understand this, you will remember the metaphors, you will remember the examples that even our Imams gave us when they were saying, for instance, that the human being should be careful what they put in their mind, rahmatullah, what they put in their mind, in their heart, in their soul, just like you are going to be careful what you put in your stomach when you eat and when you drink, you want to be careful what you put in your mind and your soul, this is going to make the person that you are and it's going to affect you. Everything that you are exposing your mind and your soul to is going to become who you are. So you have to be very careful unless you are very conscious and very aware that this is an idea, this is a person, this is a thought that I don't want to let affect me. The majority of the time we're not going to be aware of this and we're, we're being influenced by these ideas, by these thoughts, by these people, by these movies, by these songs, by these uh, novels, whatever it may be. All of this type of information is impacting us, influencing us. That's why our Imams were saying, be very careful what you let in. Be very careful who you listen to, who you choose as your teacher. Whether you are considering this person to be your teacher or not, this person is conveying information and that information is going to be, alaykum as wa rahmatullah, it's going to be affecting you, influencing you. And so be very careful. Once we went through all of this, we decided therefore that we're going to start enumerating, listing the characteristics, the good and the bad, of the people we want to follow and the people we want to avoid following. The people we want to consider to be a good scholar, a good teacher, because they have those characteristics, and the characteristics that, once they are there, we should be avoiding and considering, not considering that person to be a scholar or a teacher that we want to follow. And so, at the same time, we said, one way to look at this is to focus entirely on that other person that we want to say he's a scholar, he's a teacher. So I'm not really thinking about myself. I'm just focused on that other person as though I have a checklist and I'm looking for those good things and those bad things and see which ones match the description that I have. That's one way. The more important and the more relevant way to look at this though is to say, now that I am someone who is seeking knowledge, who is trying to become knowledgeable myself, I may not know as much as that other person, but I am now on that path. 
And therefore, when I hear a characteristic about the teacher and about the scholar, I have to look at myself and say, do I have this characteristic? Am I living up to this trait that Ahl al-Bayt are saying, the person who has knowledge should behave in a certain way, and the person who has knowledge should avoid behaving in another way? Am I matching? Am I observing the characteristics that Ahl al-Bayt are giving me? Or am I just looking at others as though this has no concern to me, it's not relevant to me, as though all the hadith are only talking about other people? So here while we are talking about the other person, the akhlaqi part of this discussion, the moral, the ethical, spiritual dimension of this discussion is that I should apply these to myself and see to what extent I am trying to become this person that Ahl al-Bayt are saying is the scholar to follow, the teacher to follow, and avoid being the scholar that Ahl al-Bayt are telling me, avoid that person, even though they may have the knowledge, even though they may share, be able to share data and information, this is still the, not the person that you want to follow, and therefore not the person you want to become, right? So inshallah, that part is clear. So part of the things that we mentioned to avoid for instance, was that someone who has knowledge, someone who has information, but they lack spirituality. And perhaps today we're going to start touching on this as a theme, the theme of spirituality or not. We'll see where, how much time we have. The second trait is that avoid people who seem to be only spreading, only sharing empty talk. They are good at talking, but their behavior does not match or even worse, contradicts what they are saying, right? So we want someone who is living by what they are saying and not just someone who is a repository, a container of information. That's not enough. Information itself, especially in today's world, information itself is easy to come by. It's, the difficulty is not the information. The difficulty is living by the values, by the teachings, by the ideas, the thoughts that are contained in that information. Okay. The, the third thing we said is that um, we want to avoid someone who seems to be using religion as an instrument in this world. They're not interested in religion for religion's sake. They're not interested in beliefs for the content, the values that those beliefs bring to their heart. They seem to be using religion for worldly reasons. It's an instrument. It's a tool like any other tool. And we know that religion can be a very, very effective tool. It's very easy to control people and manipulate people and uh, use people and abuse them by using religion because religion in itself is something very powerful if people start to believe in its ideas and uh, its values. The next point was that, um, and, and this may seem surprising, but I think we spoke about it enough, and anyone who studies the lives of Ahl al-Bayt you see the insistence on this, that they say do not surround yourself by or do not follow people who seem to have a very superficial understanding of things, that they don't have insight, they lack judgment, they don't understand the complexity of things, that reality is multi-layered, that what you're seeing may have uh, as much of an economic dimension as a political one, as a psychological one, as a spiritual one, and as a historical one, and so on and so forth. Ahl al-Bayt want us to not accept looking at things at face value, to really go deep in our understanding, our analysis of what we're looking at and what we're confronted with. So they say, especially for someone you want to consider to be your scholar, your teacher, go for someone who has a depth of understanding, someone who has a low level of self-restraint, a low level of of spiritual discipline, someone who is unable to control their desires, right? They seem to be unable to have the discipline over themselves. That weakness is already an indication, Ahl al-Bayt say, that this is someone you probably don't want to choose as the scholar, as the teacher that you want to have. The next one is that if it's someone who is excessively or seems to be excessively interested in material gains or in this world, they seem to be obsessed with this world and what this world can bring and what they can achieve in this world. And uh, finally, the last point that we said is that if it's someone who seems to lack the ability to communicate as a teacher, or what we'd call, you know, pedagogical skills, teaching skills, do they know how to communicate? 
Do they know how to adapt the message? Do they know how people think? Do they understand where people fall into thinking mistakes and they know how to avoid them or explain them or teach you how to avoid them and explain them to you, right? Or what we saw Ahl al-Bayt saying, choose the people who are knowledgeable in the arts of thinking, in the arts of deep thinking, okay? On the other side, we also saw the opposite of these traits as the traits that we want to follow and emulate when we find them in the scholar and in the teacher. Someone who has the spiritual discipline, the ability to guide, and inshallah we're going to continue specifically with this one today. Uh, someone who has an ability to stabilize, to enforce, to solidify, to anchor down your belief, to make it stronger, not weaker. They're, they're not someone who continuously spreads doubts and questions. You have to be a better this person, not further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Holy Quran or Ahl al-Bayt The next criteria is that you want someone to be leading by example, someone who seems to be preoccupied with death and after death and not just preoccupied with this world. It's important to choose people who have the right sources of knowledge. They prioritize, they give importance to the Holy Quran. All knowledge somehow has to go back to the Holy Quran, otherwise this is not Islamic knowledge, and that the intermediary to that knowledge is the knowledge that comes to us from Ahl al-Bayt And this notion that we saw, which is the notion of amana, Do they seem like they are loyal to the knowledge? They are a good caretaker of knowledge. They are a good guardian, custodian over the knowledge that they have. They know how to share it. They know how to take care of it and live by it. And we saw that one of the conditions that the Holy Prophet was giving here is to say, you know, avoid people who are followers of this world or people who have entered into this world. That's when they break the covenant. They break, they break the pledge between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We spoke about the ability to guide, to, to explain it a little bit further by looking at the relationship, and this is what we started talking about last time, the relationship of this person with knowledge. Is it someone who is humble towards knowledge? Is it someone that is constantly craving more knowledge, craving more learning? Or is it someone who feels like they already know everything that there is to know about a topic? And this is something that is not only bad for that person and themselves, but someone, something very dangerous and risky for the person learning from them because it gives you the impression that there is an end to the knowledge and it may be achieved and there's nothing else to learn about a topic, if, especially if it's an important topic or a spiritual topic, right? You don't want to have that, you know, is it? You have completed it to its end and now you can move on. If your understanding of that means that you have learned everything there is to know about that topic, about that theme, about that discipline, then this is certainly wrong. You've perhaps gained enough knowledge to say that I know the minimum necessary to know what I'm talking about in that knowledge. Knowledge is just starting for me because I have reached this point where others are saying, yes, you have our seal of approval to move on to the next phase. It's not that I think I have learned everything there is to know about this, and therefore I am now self-sufficient. No one can teach me anything anymore about it. Okay, And so when it comes to religious sciences, especially spiritual knowledge, especially, we want to make sure that we don't follow or we're not influenced by someone who brings you in that direction and makes you feel like you can reach the end of it. No, you want to be in the opposite state where you're constantly craving more and wanting to learn more. We want someone who has experienced as close as possible to our experience, as closely as possible to our experience, they have experienced not know because that experience is very helpful as a teacher. Right? They understand where you are, they can identify where you are and help you go to where you're trying to go. That's a, that was a, an important point, I think, very practical. Someone who is solid in their faith and they are not themselves a source of doubt. Uh, someone who has humility, we mentioned this. Someone who never tires of learning and they have deeper insight by opposition to what we said uh, earlier. And then the, the source for the discussion about Hum humility or modesty towards knowledge was uh, the letter 31 from Imam Ali alayhi salam to his son as we said oftentimes 
presented as being the letter to Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, even though I have doubts, and I say that it's most likely Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, it does not matter. Uh, and so one of the main things that was recurring and came back a lot, and we're going to see it again as we go through these ahadith, um, but I simply mention it now because we, we focused on it. We're looking for someone who is helping us adopt a balanced approach between mercy and understanding divine mercy and divine wrath, right? We want someone to make us really understand that on the one side, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all forgiving. And on the other side, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also just and there is a wrath and a punishment. So do not take the sins lightly, but know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here in asking for his repentance and, and forgiveness. Okay, so we want someone who is balanced in that approach and not excessively falling in one exaggerated side, pole, extreme or the other. Right, both are very dangerous. We want someone who spreads their knowledge, someone who does not hide their knowledge. And we saw the ahadith of that scholar who refuses to share their knowledge for all sorts of reasons, how they will be brought in the afterlife with a muzzle of hellfire, and they will come with a stench that no one is going to be able to handle, and so on and so forth. So that was, uh, inshallah, another uh, criteria well understood. And there was the long narration from the Imam السلام, in which he told us the seven layers or the seven categories of these evil scholars who are each one of them uh, either refusing to share their knowledge or sharing their knowledge with certain conditions that makes them evil, right? And so to each one of these categories, the Imam said is going to correspond one of the seven layers of hell, وَالْعَيَاذُ billah. And so we went through that hadith. Inshallah, all of that is clear. We don't need to repeat it. And um, so today, inshallah, we'll, we're building on all of this. So the discussion we're going to have, I'm presenting it in this way because usually it's not presented in this way, or at least it's not, you know, uh, placed as a discussion where we are talking about it. And I think it's important, and there is a logical sequence, a logical structure to what we're talking about. We do want to talk about what this person who teaches, what are they exactly teaching? So in a lot of ways, it's going to touch the next heading in our series, which is the types of knowledge. Which types of knowledge? We've been talking about the importance of learning knowledge, of then teaching knowledge, of building a community of knowledge. That will be the next little topic we address. Once we're done with that, we're going to talk about the types of knowledge. How do we prioritize? What do we study first and then second and then third? Okay, And then the types of knowledge that our religion says are important to study. So inshallah, that's our next big heading. So a lot of what we're talking about now could easily be put in that discussion. Here we're presenting it from another angle. We're talking about the teacher. We're looking for the characteristics of the teacher, the traits of the scholar that we want to follow. So look at the ahadith from this angle, as we did with previous ahadith that we looked at. Look at it from this angle. We're looking at it as when I become the scholar, when I share religion, what am I actually doing? And what am I doing? Does it match what Ahl al-Bayt are presenting as the characteristics, the traits of the scholars or not? Okay, so that applies to me and that also applies to those I want to follow and I want to be influenced by. Okay, the first hadith, and there is a lot of themes here, and I, I can't go through all of them because it's going to be very repetitive to a lot of things we talked about. So inshallah, they're clear enough, but happy to engage in a discussion afterwards too. The first hadith from Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, and these are supposed to be well-known hadith. I'm just not sure if people have seen them from this angle or not. They may be new to some of you. Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, he says in one of the hadith, أوحى الله تعالى إلى موسى عليه السلام حببني إلى خلقي وحبب خلقي إلي. So Imam Sajjad Zain al-Abidin Ali ibn al-Hussein عليه السلام he says God Almighty revealed to Prophet Musa عليه السلام make me beloved to my creatures and make my creatures beloved to me. Make my creatures love me and make me love my creatures. Okay, that's the beginning of the hadith. قال, so, قال يا رب, كيف أفعل? How do I do this? How do I make your creatures love you? And how do I make you love your creatures? قال, 
ذكرهم آلائي ونعمائي ليحبوني Remind them, so he said, O oh Lord, how do I do this? How do I make them beloved to you and I make you beloved to them? He said, remind them of my gifts. Remind them of my bounties so that they may love me. Okay? Next. فَلَئِنْ تَرُدَّ آبِقًا عَنْ بَابِي So if you were to return, آبِق is like a fugitive, someone who has run away. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa alayhi salam, if you bring back someone who has run away from me, from my door, right? A fugitive who has run away from my door. Or someone who is misguided or lost away from my space or my entrance. Fana is the entrance of the door, right? Right before or right after, that's fana al-dar, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, someone who has run away, someone who is misguided, has lost the entrance of of my uh, of my space, my garden, my entrance. أَفْضَلُ لَكَ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ مَا أَتِي سَنَةِ بِصِيَامِ نَهَارِهَا وَقِيَامِ لَيْلِهَا It is better for you to do this, to bring back someone who has lost the way, who has lost the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the entrance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's better for you to bring that person back, to make them see where the door is, than to pray and to fast continuously for 100 years. قال موسى عليه السلام ومن هذا العبد الآبق منك Who is this person who who is has become a fugitive who has run away from you oh god who is this person that i'm looking for who has lost the entrance the door of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala قال العاصي المتمرد the sinner who is stubborn right this is someone who is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who is stubborn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say, this person is someone I never want to see again. He says, this is someone who has lost the way. They've lost the entrance to my door. Bring them back. Just make this person see my door again so that they come back. And he taught him how. He told him, remind them of my gifts. Remind them of my bounties to them. And then he continues. قال فمن الضال عن فنائك موسى عليه السلام continues he asks even more clarity who is it who is lost away from your entrance and here is the punchline the reason we're talking about all of this he asked who is the soul who is lost away from your entrance قال الجاهل بإمام زمانه تعرفه the one who does not know who is the leader to be followed in his time who is the person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed for you as a guide that you're supposed to follow? Show them that that person is to be followed at every given time. And the person who they may know who the leader of their time is, but that leader is not available to them. So they can't learn from them directly. So what do you do in that case? الجاهل بشريعة دينه تعرفه شريعته The one who does not know the laws, the regulations of their religion, you teach them those laws. وما يعبد به ربه And that which or through which they can worship their Lord. ويتوصل به إلى مرضاته And therefore achieve the pleasure, the satisfaction of their Lord. قال علي عليه السلام so this is Imam Sajjad alayhi salam at the end. So he just told us a narration between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Now the Imam himself is going to comment on this hadith. He's going to say, فَأَبْشِرُوا مَعَاشِرَ عُلَمَاءِ شِيَعَتِنَا بِالثَّوَابِ الْعَظِيمِ Therefore, rejoice, scholars from among our followers, for the great rewards and the abundant recompense or retribution or reward awaiting you by bringing people back to the door of God. There are teachings to teach, there's information to share, and there's a person to point to. And so this means that we have to understand at every time, what does that mean? At the time of Imam Ali alayhi salam, I should be pointing people to Imam Ali alayhi salam. And at the time of Imam al-Mahdi ajallah farajah, I should be pointing people to Imam al-Mahdi ajallah farajah. And explaining that this is the leader of your time. This is the person you are linked back to. And not the opposite. I'm not calling people to me. I'm not calling people to so-and-so. 
I'm calling people back to the Imam, as this hadith was saying. And this is the notion, the higher notion of Imam. Oftentimes when we think about Imam, we think of the Imam as the 12 Imams, as though there are no other Imams. The real notion of Imam in the true sense, the theological sense, the notion of Imam in the Holy Quran goes way beyond our 12 Imams, right? There's a Quranic Imam. Ibrahim alayhi salam was an Imam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the descendants of Ibrahim. He says, وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً We made them Imams. Who are they? These are prophets who achieved the rank of Imam after they passed tests, right? لَمَّا صَبَرُوا وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يُقِنُونَ they achieved a, they showed, they displayed a rank of conviction and certainty and truth after we went, made them go through the difficulties and the tribulations and the tests and challenges. They showed their true faith and they were able to achieve the rank of Imam. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Musa alayhi salam, help them see who their Imam is. Right? In the time of Musa alayhi salam, Harun was there, Yunus was there, but he is their Imam. Right? He achieved that role. The same thing can be said about other prophets. So this is the higher notion. There is one guide. Everybody brings back to that one guide. Everybody is explaining what that guide is saying. That's the person we're looking for. At every time, and this hadith is another proof for that argument, that at every given time, at every given era, there is a guide. And our role as scholars is to point back to that guide to bring back to that guide. That's the first hadith. A second hadith from Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. And again, there are a lot of themes here. I, I don't have time to go through all of them. I think these hadith are very dense and each of them would require a series to be explained. We're going fast. The next hadith is from Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. And again, it's a longer hadith. I'm just taking the part that is relevant. He says, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam said, علماء شيعتنا مرابطون بالثغر الذي يلي إبليس وعفاريته يمنعونهم الخروج على ضعفاء شيعتنا. So Imam al-Askari alayhi salam says, Imam al-Sadiq said, okay, he is narrating the narration of Imam al-Sadiq. He said, Imam al-Sadiq said, the scholars from among our followers are the ones who remain at the borders, who remain at the frontiers. Of what? Thughur, usually you're going to say this is the border of, your, of the nation, the border of your country, of your state. You're waiting for the enemy to attack and you're protecting the borders of your country, right? Which borders? The Imam doesn't say. He just says they are the ones who remain at the borders. Our scholars are the ones who remain at the borders. What do they do? Behind which, behind these borders, behind these frontiers, behind which Iblis, Satan, the devil, hides with his demons, with his supporters, with his afarit, okay, with his soldiers, with these wicked, uh, vile supporters or soldiers of his. Okay, what does he say next? They prevent them from attacking. Attacking who? يَمْنَعُونَهُمْ عَنِ الْخُرُوجِ عَلَى ضُعَفَاءِ شِيَعَتِنَا They prevent them from attacking the weak ones from among our followers. So what borders are they talking about? Is it a physical, geographical border? No. The role of the scholar is to be at the edge, is to be at that limit of where faith is, where religion is, where it starts and where it ends. So that you are ready for the attacks, you are ready for the arguments, you are ready for the dangers, you are ready for the risks attacking faith, attacking belief. Right? This is the role of the scholar. They understand it means that that scholar at any given time, in any given culture, in any given society, that scholar understands what the dangers are. They understand where the danger is coming from. How is the danger going to penetrate our land, which is faith, which is religion, which is creed? How is the attack happening and how do I defend it? They have an ability to protect. They have an ability to push back, to defend to defend who? In this hadith, they said, the weak ones. Are they weak physically? No. The attack is not physical. The attack is ideological. They are attacking you with beliefs, with ideas, with values, with principles. The role of the scholar is to protect you. 
And they have to be always there, always performing this task, on the lookout. Where is the attack coming from? How is it happening? How do we defend against this attack? How do we defend against that attack? Is the attack that happened 50 years ago going to be the same as it is today? Of course not. 2,000 years ago? Of course not. This means that this is someone who understands the landscape of belief, of religion, of what's going on. And the Imam says, these are the true scholars. He defined them very well. He said, ushi'atina. These are the scholars of our, among our followers. This is what you're looking for. You understand, this person understands the dangers, the risks, where the attack is coming from and how to defend against it so that the weaker Shia, those who don't have the knowledge and the ability of these scholars, they remain protected. Okay, that's the first hadith. And as we said, this hadith continues. Therefore, the hadith, inshallah, we're going to come back to it later when we're going to talk about the merits of the scholars. Because this hadith continues. Because of this amazing task, this great task that these scholars are performing, therefore they will deserve and they will earn those merits, those ranks, because of the work that they're doing here. It's not an easy task to be at the front line, to be dealing with these attacks from the enemy. That here the Imam simply simplified, reduced to Iblis and his followers. Satan himself is attacking from here, as well as his supporters, his demons. Okay, so that's the first hadith. The next hadith from Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam. He said, إِنَّ مَنْ تَكَفَّلَ بِأَيْتَامِ آلِ مُحَمَّدٍ Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. إِنَّ مَنْ تَكَفَّلَ بِأَيْتَامِ آلِ مُحَمَّدٍ الْمُنْقَطِعِينَ عَنْ إِمَامِهِمْ Here the Imam again is going to give us the traits of the scholar we're looking for. The one who takes care, the one who sponsors who, is, who becomes a guardian over who? The Imam calls them orphans. Who are the orphans? The true orphan in the ahadith of Ahl al-Bayt is who? Is the person who no longer has the direct link to the Imam. That's the orphan. You no longer have access to your Imam. The physical in appearance manifestation of this orphanage in our world is that you don't have access to your parents. Your real source of parenthood in this world is an ideological source. Our parents are our source. This is where we came from. Our existence came from them. At the world of belief, our source is the Imam. Our source is the person that God designates and tells us, this is your source of knowledge. This is your source of Belief, you go back to that person. If you're cut off from that person, just like if you are cut off from your parent in the physical world, you're considered an orphan. So Ahl al-Bayt referred to people who are no longer directly linked to their imam as being orphans, aytam. And this is one of the meanings in the Holy Quran that are given when the verses talk about the yatim. وَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ And other verses, if you go back to the narrations of Ahl al-Bayt, they're consistent. They always talk about the person initially, the real meaning, the person who is cut off from their imam. Bring them back to their imam. Take, remove them from the state of orphanage they're in. Link them back to their imam. Again, we're starting to see the characteristic of the scholar, the trait of the scholar we're looking for. The one who sponsors, the one who guards over the orphans from the family of Muhammad وآله, the Holy Prophet, المنقطعين عن إمامهم, the ones who are cut off from their leader, the ones who are cut off from their imam. المتحيرين في جهلهم, the ones who are confused, lost in their ignorance. الأسراء في أيدي شياطينهم, the ones who are imprisoned in the hands of their Devils, right? So this could be out of weakness. This could be out of confusion. Link it with the previous hadith, right? Who are these devils? They're the ones who attack your belief, right? You are now becoming imprisoned, right? The weak ones, if they were not protected in the previous hadith, what happens? You are taken as a prisoner. Now you are in the hands of the enemy. The imam says the ones who are in the hands of the devils. وَفِي أَيْدِ النَّوَاصِبِ مِنْ أَعْدَائِنَا and the ones who have landed in the hands of the 
hating ones from our enemies. minhum, And then he rescues them from their hands. And he removes them from their state of confusion, ignorance, loss. وَقَهَرَ الشَّيَاطِينَ بِرَدِّ وَسَاوَسِهِمْ And then he is, he is able to be victorious over. He defeats the devils. بِرَدِّ وَسَاوَسِهِمْ He is able to push back on the doubts that these devils are able to create in the minds of the followers. وَقَهَرَ النَّاصِبِينَ بِحُجَجِ رَبِّهِمْ And the, ones, the one who is able to defeat the hating enemies of Ahlul Bayt by using the arguments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَدَلِيلِ أَئِمَّتِهِمْ And the proofs presented to them from their imams. And then the hadith continues, and inshallah we'll come back to it later. Then the imam starts to explain the merits, the rewards of these scholars. But the part that we're interested in here is the function, the role, the characteristic of the scholar we're looking for. What's the role of this scholar? What are they doing? Are they just sharing information? Is it random information? No. There's a structure. There's a purpose. There's a plan to the information that is being shared. That it brings you back to your imam. That there's an understanding of where the attacks are coming from. That makes you attached to your imam in a weaker way. And eventually to cut off your tie from your imam. If this is what's happening, your role as a scholar, and therefore as a learner looking for a teacher, looking for a scholar, is to look for that scholar who brings you back, who prevents this from happening, right? The next hadith, and maybe we can stop with this one, the next hadith from Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam. Just in case, you know, I always try to give more if it's a new topic or uh, a topic that requires more thinking, a deeper topic, when we see two, three, four ahadith, we see how they explain each other. We've always said that. This is one of the miraculous parts of the ahadith of Ahl al-Bayt salam. You move across 200, 250 years of ahadith and you see how they all explain each other. And they use the same metaphors and the same terminology and the same images. And they keep explaining the same thing from different aspects as though they all sat together and decided how to say things all at once when this is happening over generations and generations of time. In any case, the next hadith from Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam, he says, لَوْلَا مَنْ يَبْقَى بَعْدَ غَيْبَةِ قَائِمِكُمْ alayhi salam. So if it were not following the occultation, this is Imam al-Hadi. This is two generations before Imam al-Mahdi faraja. This is the grandfather of Imam al-Mahdi talking. He says, لولا من يبقى بعد غيبة قائمكم من العلماء الداعين إليه. So if it were not following the occultation of the one who will rise among you, for the scholars who call to him, the scholars who invite to him, bring people back to him, والدالين عليه, the ones who guide to him or point to him, والذابين عن دينه, the ones who sacrifice in order to protect his faith, to protect his religion. So they are defending the religion of this one among you who will rise and they are using what to do so? They are using the proofs, the evidence, the arguments of God and they are rescuing those who are his weaker servants, the weaker servants of Allah, weak and physically, Again, no. Weak theologically, weaker in belief, affected by what the devil and his supporters are trying to do. They are rescuing them from the nets, from the traps and the nets of the devil and his supporters. And from the traps of those who hate Ahl al Bayt with enmity if it were not for these scholars then there would remain no one except those who have turned away from the religion of God they are the ones who hold the reins just like you control an animal by holding its reins 
They are the ones, these scholars, who hold the reins of the hearts of the followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhum as salam كَمَا يُمْسِكُ صَاحِبُ السَّفِينَةِ سُكَّانَهَا As the captain of the ship holds the steering wheel of the ship, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْأَفْضَلُونَ عَنْدَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ Those are the ones who are better before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the scholars that Ahlul Bayt are talking about, and the Imam here is talking about the future. He's saying the one who will rise is going to have a ghayba. And this was well known throughout the history of Ahlul Bayt. In fact, all Muslims know this. And we've talked about this in the past. How throughout history, they would call their sons, the Abbasids especially, they would call their sons Al-Mahdi, so that people would say, this is the person. And they even added other characteristics of the Imam that were well known, so that people would follow them and consider them to be the one who would be sent towards the end of times and so on and so forth. This is all well known. So this is before the time of the Imam. And here Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam, the grandfather of Imam al-Mahdi, is saying this is the characteristic. This is the trait. In other words, he's saying before these scholars are born, before these scholars are performing any work, they don't exist yet. The Imam is saying there's going to be scholars who perform this role. Those are the scholars we're looking for. Those are the scholars who are going to be before God, the better ones. Okay, so for us, if we're talking about characteristics, if we're talking about traits of scholars, this is one more trait to add. In short, we're looking for the scholar, when we talked about the sources of knowledge, we're looking for the scholars that bring us back to Ahlul Bayt salam. We're not looking for the scholar who gives us things that they have come up with. That's cool and good and nice for them. What we are ordered to do, what secures our salvation, the reason why we want to follow someone else and not rely on our own opinions is that we are trying to see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to know. And this is only through the infallible. This is only through the person that Allah appoints as our guide in this life. Okay, so inshallah we'll continue. The next time we meet, we're going to be talking about some of the moral traits of the scholars as they are mentioned in the ahadith. And so we're going to talk about you know, the good and the bad, the ones to avoid and the ones we want to see. You know, foolishness, arrogance, we've talked about some of them. We're going to see some of the same ones explained in a different way and new ones as well. Inshallah, we'll talk about all of that. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajal faraja. So I think we have a little bit of time for any questions, concerns, comments. Tfadl. So practically speaking, what does it look like to be bringing people towards uh, the Imam of their time? Is it from the sense of teaching them aqaid so that they're able to recognize the Imam? Or is it from the sense of sharing their knowledge and their teachings um, instead of bringing teachings from other sources? So what does it look like practically to bring people back to the Imam? In short, it's the latter. It's to explain the teachings of the Imams to the people. And when people are ready... You can't just jump into the topic of imama with someone without explaining how you get there, right? And this is part of your ability to guide. Your ability to guide includes the logical arguments and structure you put in place to get someone to agree to see the truth by themselves. It means that you presented the arguments in the logical way that gets them to see the truth by themselves. You're not imposing the truth on them from the outside, right? And Ahlul Bayt salam say exactly that. They don't tell people, you know, bring them to us. They tell them, teach them our sayings. Bring to them the beauty of our sayings. And as soon as they will hear what we have to say, it means the content of the teachings, they will come to us. People will want to know, where is that coming from? Who taught you this? You say, yeah, my source is Ali alayhi salam. My source is Fatima. My source is a Sadiq alayhi salam. And that opens the door to the discussion of Imam. That's in practical way. Of course, you can do it the other way, the formal way, and go through the entire you know, logical structure and sequence as we have done, but this is not always going to be possible for someone else, right? Someone who is completely new to all of this. That would be the quick, short answer to this. Tfadl. And uh, we talked previously about one of the traits of the scholar is that uh, the source of his knowledge goes back to the Quran and the debate. So um, I guess... On that, we're looking for the source of his knowledge. Here, we're, we're looking to see, does he bring people to a little bit through that knowledge? 
Chris, just to kind of uh, compare the two. Both, yes. So on the one side, all the knowledge that they are sharing, how do you bring people back? What no The content and the how. The what and the how. The what is you're bringing back to those teachings, those sources, and what you're doing, what you're using to get them back is the Holy Quran and the sayings themselves. But you have to know enough to be able to do it, to be able to apply it and put it in practice. Uh, just a comment probably. Uh, in the hadith, there was a lot of emphasis on the people who have nasab towards the Ahlul Bayt And it seems like uh, it is part of uh, every generation of the Imams. And uh, uh, because it looks like there is a lot of emphasis on that, um, perhaps uh, I was thinking of uh, how in this uh, society of ours nowadays, how do we uh, deal, deal with the, these uh, people who have nasab towards Ahlul Bayt? And uh, it was just uh, a thought of, of mine how it was recurring in these uh, hadiths. So the recurrence of the term of nawasab in the ahadith, very clearly, if I remember, and I haven't done a study on this, but very clearly from the time of Mamil al-Baqir onwards, there are very clear ahadith that explicitly mention the nawasab. And I don't know if for before, nothing comes to mind right now. Um, and the manner in which the nawasab were defined is very interesting by Ahl al-Bayt salam when some of the companions of Ahlul Bayt would come to them and they would say um, that, you know, we, we want to talk about the Nawasab or with the Nawasab or against the Nawasab, it would give the impression that, you know, it's someone who openly hates the Imams. And the Imams told their companions, no, no one will come out and openly and explicitly say they are against us or that they hate us. We're the family of the Holy Prophet. No one will say that. They will show that enmity by hating you, the Imams told their followers. They will show their enmity to us by hating our followers. And how this happens over time can change. The way it manifests itself can be different, but we can still recognize it. And when we recognize it, it's up to us to, one, know that it's happening, and two, how to deal with it. But this is the role, this is the job of the scholar. What's the best way to deal with this? Do I deal with it head on? Do I deal with it in an indirect way? Which you know communication tools do I use? Which channels do I use? This is part of the wisdom and the, the, the judgment required to deal with all of this. But this is the job of the scholar, to see what's the most appropriate way, as you would have in the war strategist who looks at the, the map and understands that the best way to deal with this enemy at this time is in this way, and that enemy at that time in that way. Right? This is an expertise that is required. I don't know if I answered, but inshallah it's clear. Inshallah. Tfadlu. So, in the, the question is oriented like within the context of you know, the, the Shia community. Because the whole lecture was linked to Imam, linked to uh, uh, Imam as, as being you know, one of the pillars of our religion. Uh, so uh, again, so the question I will reformulate the question of Brother Ali saying, how would be the practical way to bring ourselves to Imam rather than bring others to them? Because the, the question, the, the insisting question over time and over decades and, and from the time of the Imam uh, Ali Ali Salam down to Imam Khajar Salam, we, st we still were not getting brought to, to the real meaning of Imam. Um, um, sometimes we got distracted, thinking that the priority is probably elsewhere. Probably the priority is to bring more Shia to the Shia. Probably, the, probably is to you know, debate you know, philosophical <coughs> thoughts and, 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 and matters. Well, the priority is, are we really linked to, to, to Imam? And um, the Imam, as the general meaning you pointed out, has been the Imam al-Awwal in the Quran. And then uh, Ibrahim was Imam. 
most of the, the prophets were, were imams, so they, they reached that, that rank of, of imam. And then we, it's, it's only because, or by the, uh, the uh, imams of al bayt that we have recognized that the imama is not what the common Muslim think it is. Well, like, especially if you have some, some, some knowledge from the, the, you know, the Sunni and other schools uh, within, within, uh, within the, uh, the uh, Muslim community, they always refer, they always refer Imam to, you know, either, either, you know, they bring it up to the prophethood, some of the prophets, or they, they pull it down to uh, a very, you know, very uh, elementary um, notion, which is Imam of Masjid, which is a leader, and, and that's it, or probably a teacher. So, regardless what you want, what we do, we're, we're like we can, we can have like a good faith and, and reason to bring in others to Salat al Mustaqim, bring them to Alhamdulillah wa Manahi Amrana. So they ask uh, how we do to to do that, accomplish that. So Alim al Nas Aluman, Hadithuhum Hadiza, Ida Alim Udalik Habuna, Utabaun. But like regardless of the attention that we can we can do, and which is itself a, a virtue, bring it out as to the to the path to the right path. We should first start with ourselves, and 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 through the to the, the, the stories of Imam al we we can see clearly some people pretended to be among the Imam and companions and, and faithful to the Imam, while they, they were not, and and history you know unveiled them. Right? Some who were with Imam Ali, and then they persecuted in, in Kabra, they fought, they, they, fight, tried, they fought against Imam Hussein, and, and, and it kept going. Some of his Sahaba companion of Imam turned out to be enemies of the next Imam. Mm -hmm. So, and those are, you know, cl physically close to the, to the Imam. So, so it's, it's, it's one, of the, one of the major concerns of us, of a Shia, how to fix this, this matter in our brain first. And then and, and then practice it, implement it in a daily basis. That's that's one. And and from the practical um, view of it, uh, like just uh, it happened to me just a couple of days ago. So uh, the notion of the relativity of time, and and it was like it was a huge debate, uh, philosophical debates, and now it, it turns into the quantum debates. How to do we would, 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 would we define the time in the absolute or the relative? A notion, etc. And it turns out that Imam Sadiq you know, was, I wasn't surprised, but I, it, it's, it, it's a, a natural reflex to go to, go back to Al Bayt and see if they have, we have something substantial. And it turns out that Imam Sadiq has been, you know, I, I haven't found like a, a detailed, you know, uh, topic or research. I should probably put more time to, to find out. But he was among the all the Imam who really defined the relative notion of time. So we still, people everywhere, like among the Muslims and non-Muslims, they're still debating of the time, relativity of time, whether it is there time or not. And you may have known that and, and, and have gone through all, all that. And uh, the the origin of the universe, Imam Ali Sassam, he thoroughly explained it and, and just on the top of my mind, just uh, when he uh, used the uh, Zabad al Rabi, he explained by the first second of the creation of the universe, we're still debating. But within the Shia community, and out, 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 outside the Shia, we're still, we're still in, the, in the first part. We haven't moved yet. Right? So, practically, like, how could we really get close to the truth of knowledge, source of knowledge, of light? Of, we all pretend that we are followers. Are we really? So, I, I, I know that the question is really, <laughs> really hard. But the more, the most, the more you know things about uh, as great, the more you 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 realize that you're you, you're ignorant. The more you touch the, the you know their light, the more you realize that you're in obscure spot, spot, and you're still starting to. You mentioned the not enough the item anymore. It, it, it moved me every time I, I hear this, this hadith from years, and I, I, it will it will do for all my life. We are orphans. We're in, in the deep sense of it. So, how could we get adopted? 
Yeah, so thank you very much for that. It's not a question, it's a it's a, a long uh, comment, but I think a very relevant one. Um, I, I think there's a very, it's simple, but it's not easy, as they say. The answer is very simple, but it's not easy. It was the same thing in the time of the Holy Prophet. Everybody has the same access to the Holy Prophet. Not everyone is going to benefit in the same way. And you see it very clearly from those who completely rejected to those who completely submitted and accepted. And that's the key with Imam Ali alayhi salam being the extreme of those who submit and accept. Right? And the Holy Quran is very simple. مَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوا مَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنُهُ فَانْتَهُوا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبُكُمُ اللَّهِ That's it. Follow what we're telling you. The problem is, the next layer of, of the problem is, one, we don't even know. We don't know anything about our imams. A lot of the things you're describing, it would, you know, it, the assumption is that I know that it's there and I'm deciding to f look into it or not. The truth is, I'm not even aware that this is there. For the majority of us, what do we know? What do we know about, you're mentioning Imam al what do I know about Imam al-Sadiq? I don't even understand the rudiments, you know, the basics, the fundamentals about him. So that's like a first layer. And this is something we saw. The moment you start moving in that direction, starting to get to know Ahl al-Bayt this is the, I think, the, the, the general feeling that anyone has. Anyone who starts to move towards that light, you're, you're awestruck by what you find and you can't stop. It, you become obsessive and you want everyone to see it. But if someone doesn't move towards that, that's it. They're, and so, you know, to each his own and to each to their capacity. How, how much can you take from that light? You and I are not going to be able to take the same thing and, and the third person and the fourth. And you have people who are not even interested in looking. What do you want to do with that? That's it. In the Karantahdiman Ahabat and it stops there. So your job is to do as much as you can. Your job is to one know Ahd al Bayt and know what their teachings are. We don't know what the teachings of Ahd al Bayt are. That was kind of one of the main drivers behind this series, is that we stop talking about theories and knowledge that you find in books, as good and valuable as it is. Let's just go back to the ahadith of Ahd al Bayt. That's why I don't say anything from myself, right? I, I bring the hadith and I read it and I explain some words in the hadith and we stop there. The rest I leave it to you. Go read the books, the commentary to each his own and that's all good. But we don't even know what Ahl al-Bayt have said. Exactly like you mentioned, the first khutbah of Imam Ali alayhi salam in Nahj al-Balagha. How many people have spent time reading it? Before we say, you know, this is a glimpse of what Imam Ali alayhi salam talked about. Or Imam al-Sadiq mentioning, for instance, something about time, the nature of time. Who in his time is going to understand it? When Imam Ali salam says, Saluni qabla an tafqiduni. And then there is this hadith when they came to the Imam and they kept asking him questions. Imam Ali alayhi salam. And he answers one question after another. And the man told him, How do you answer so quickly? You don't even think. You just give the answer. And the Imam told him, Open your hand. What do you see in it? He told him, I see five fingers. He told him, Knowledge to me is as clear as you seeing five fingers. That's it. But people are not interested. That, that's the source of knowledge. That's what we're trying to go back to. But when you start to compete with the knowledge of the Imam, it's like the Imam knows and I also know. I also have an opinion and I also have a theory. Come to me. I will teach you my theory. Who are you? <laughs> and what do I care about your theory? That should be our answer. Right? And I should tell that to myself. Before I go to someone else, I should tell that to myself. Who am I and what is my theory? What do I care about what I have to say? Why don't I go back to the person that God said, submit to this person. I'm appointing this person to you as a guide. The problem is we don't go there. There's always obstacles. We put something in the way, then at the end we don't go to that person. <laughs> this is the nature of this world, otherwise everybody would be guided. Right? Like the, the truth should be clear to all. This is what the Holy Quran says. There, there is no way to explain that the truth is clear. It's self-manifest. But if someone rejects the truth, and this is why God is so angry in the Holy Quran, if we can permit ourselves to say it in this way, against those who reject the truth. How can you see the truth, be exposed to the truth, and reject the truth? It means you're stubborn. Right? And that's what the Holy Quran says. The, they know the truth. They recognize it, but... They have conviction, they have certainty that this is the truth. But they reject it. 
Okay, so then, then that's it. You have waged a war against God. God says, this is a truth. You say, I know, I reject it. Okay, then you've, you've opened the door to yourself for the war against God. What do you expect now? Right? So inshallah, we, we don't fall into this, but there's certainly a lot more we can do to get to know the imams. And I think the next step, but the next step is a logical derivative. Like we, we shouldn't be have to say it. You know, you have to have an, a link that goes beyond the abstract theory with our imams. You have to have that. That's the wilaya. You have to have that. But we shouldn't have to say that. All you need to do is, you know, you see the truth. You see the, the beauty of it. That means that, of course, you're going to end up there. That's, that's the logical conclusion of ending up with an attachment to the imam of your time. If you actually took the steps to get to know him, to get to know his teachings, which should mean you also got to know the previous imams and their teachings who guided you to him. But they didn't leave you by yourself on your own. Right? So that's the, the logical first step is get to know the imams and you will see that you, you will get sucked into that beauty. And that's it. You will be on your journey. And this is the arena of competition. May the best win. One person will go, you know, three steps and another will go a mile and another will go <laughs> the entire journey. And Imam Ali says, there is no end to the journey. How long it is. It's, there's no end to it. It's infinite. You can go as far as you want. Right? So, I don't know if that answers or not. And you mentioned very quickly this idea of imamah. Yes, the biggest difference is that the imamah that we believe in and we talk about is a divine rank. Unfortunately, imamah is presented as being a political position. So political position has nothing to do with the divine rank. It should be a logical conclusion of it. But when we talk about imamah, we're not mentioning anything that is associated with a political position that someone may hold or not. Right? Unfortunately, a lot of our talk goes always back to a political position. And so it's equated with something like khilafa. Some, someone in a position of political authority has nothing to do with imamah. Imamah is a divine rank. It's like saying nubuwa or rasala. That's imamah. It's a divine rank. And of course, under there, somewhere, we can also open the discussion of does it necessarily mean if you are an imam that you are also the one who holds a political authority? But that becomes a secondary discussion. Let's first agree on the divine rank, that this is a divine position about imam, and that will solve a lot of issues. It means that we're not even agreeing on definitions when we're talking about it, and yet we're having a whole discussion. That you say imam is, and I say imam is. Right? So we have to agree on what is imam. If we both agree that it's a divine rank in the Quranic sense, then I think we have at least a common ground to start from and see where the discussion goes. And then a lot of the arguments are going to self-annihilate, as they say. You don't even need to have the discussion if you agree with that premise to start with about imam. Anyways, I'll, I'll stop here. Otherwise, uh, this is a non-ending discussion. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين